This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The 10 Minute Time Out is a mini podcast that brings Mississippi sports stories to life. Join me, Lacey Alexander, as I learn more about the teams, athletes, staff, and programs that make our state proud. One on one interviews with influential playmakers paint a clear picture for listeners of how Mississippi sports inspire and energize our community. New episodes released every other Friday on your favorite podcasting app. Good morning, and thanks for being with us this morning. I am Dr. Susan Budras. I'm a professor of pediatrics and a developmental behavioral pediatrician and host for you, Unrelatively Speaking. I've done this for several years. So today, we're talking about a topic that I think is very important, and it's sort of a cross between loneliness and being excluded or overlooked and um, a topic that that I think many of us have struggled with over the years. Um, You know, a lot of us are back to our life routines. They were going on before the pandemic. But I think every single researcher out there says life's not going to be the same. We've changed our lives. We live them differently. We've constricted them. We've become less likely to step out of our day-to-day comfort zone. Many people have a very limited number of close friends now. Many work from home and gather in smaller groups. And that may be good and comfortable for us, but are we leaving some people out? Have we started overlooking, forgetting, or excluding people who really need us to be there for him. So, Abram, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Buttress. How are you doing? I am doing well. This is kind of a tough topic because we have to really do a little introspection about what Uh, we're doing. A lot of introspection. Yeah. For sure. And, um, you know, I, I have a story that I kind of want to start with because it explains why this topic came back up. We talked about loneliness back in May of last year, and I think loneliness is pervasive, and people forget how many people experience it. But the idea of really expanding this topic a little bit more beyond loneliness It came to me after I was checking my email a couple of weeks ago. So I was checking my email, and I saw an email from a dear older relative of mine. You know, I'm from a big family, but this individual is very special to me. And we occasionally email back and forth. The subject line read, I'm still here. And that person had sent the email to a few of us, and the the body of the email itself was just touching base and catching up. But that subject line was honestly like a punch in the stomach. That's that's devastating. Yeah. That's really sad. I'm still here. Yeah. And so um, it almost makes me tear up every time I think about reading that. Because uh, clearly it was it, it was a call to notice me, be be back with me, interact with me. It was that non spoken statement that maybe she felt overlooked, perhaps left out, maybe ignored. All of those words, and I honestly sincerely was horrified that she might feel that way since I think about that individual very often and in fact probably daily but what I don't do and what I think we all fail to do many times not being selfish or being exclusive or you know trying to leave somebody out we just don't stop and take the time And so many times, 
those individuals who who perhaps haven't heard from us may start wondering why and may create reasons like, oh, well, I'm old, they've already written me off. Or, oh, well, I'm sick and they don't want to talk about my illness. And, or, oh, well, I'm not as fun as I used to be, so nobody wants to be around me. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder how much people put that on themselves. Yeah, yeah. And and it truly does happen. And researchers have looked at this. And, and as I was going through some of the research about being overlooked or excluded or or lonely obviously there's there's a lot written on loneliness but not quite as much on that that overlooked category or the excluded category and i want to talk a little bit about how there's so much crossover in those two areas because in those three areas that i mentioned because they they really are but one thing that we do know is that that there's some psychological damage done to being overlooked or excluded. And though it's a fairly old study, back in 2014, a researcher named Sandra Robinson looked at the psychological damage in the workplace, particularly compared uh, between bullying versus exclusion. So who who is damaged more if you were bullied or if you were excluded? And guess what? Uh, I have a guess because of the topic, yeah. but I would have guessed bullying. You would have sure. guessed bullying. I would have too. But it's the exclusion is more hurtful emotionally because it's silent right? It's one of those silent damages that what is your response to it? If you're excluded, is it because you were over, overlooked and nobody noticed you? Are you that not noticeable? Or is it that you were overlooked because nobody wants to be around you? And so is, is something wrong with you? Whereas with bullying, typically there's a direct assault, right? Uh, you have the opportunity to at least respond to the direct assault. So don't get me wrong, neither one is good. They're both damaging. But to keep in mind that if there are people out there in in your life circle who somehow have drifted outside that tight light circle, it might be time to think about figuring out a way to pull it back in to do something about it. So I think as we go through the show, I would love to hear from our listeners who have possible stories about feeling excluded from maybe a a work group or a school group or um, even a family group. And I do think it happens in families. I am certain of that. I'm from a big family, as I mentioned, and and I've seen a little bit of everything. But uh, as you have gone through that, have what have you what have you experienced, listeners, in your life from that being overlooked or excluded, and what have you been able to do about it, if anything, or do you have a question about how you you'd like to know how to deal with it? As we move along in the show, we'll talk about that and and what you can do, and perhaps. There's some thought by researchers that there are some things that we as individuals do or don't do that allow us to more likely be excluded or, or overlooked. And so that all contributes to loneliness. And um, as, as we talk through that, I, I'm 
want to make sure that we don't forget that 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 lone loneliness. Um, it's not just exclusion, but the feeling of just really being lonely, even if there are people around you, is also something that can be very damaging and very hurtful. So it does seem as we're moving along that that on this topic that there are certain people who sort of set themselves up to be more in the limelight and and more noticed. And um, as we talk through it, you'll find that it's not necessarily the individual who's the smartest, the brightest, the best talker, or the, the prettiest or the most athletic. You'll find that it's something very different as we move along. We'll talk about that. Tell me what you're thinking about this topic. Have you experienced that exclusion that has hurt you so badly? Have you felt like you've been overlooked for something that perhaps you should have been the one chosen for it? You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. This is Relatively Speaking. We're talking about the topic, I am still here. Don't overlook me. Welcome back, and thanks for being with us today on Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Abram Nanny, and today we are talking about overlooked, ignored, or excluded. And, and why does that happen to some people? Is it the same thing as loneliness? Not necessarily, but certainly loneliness can be the result of being overlooked or excluded because you can be in a room full of individuals where there is a group talking and you're outside that group circle. You can be in a work group where people tend to pick teams and work in teams and and you don't get picked. And after a while, it can feel very terrible. Um, you know, as we're looking through the research, it appears that there are two groups who tend to be more lonely and feel more excluded than others. And it probably wouldn't surprise you terribly. The elderly is one group. And guess what the second group is, Abram? Can you guess? I'm going to guess teenagers. Wow, good yeah. job. Yep, absolutely, adolescents. And and that's not a big surprise. And and one thing that I have, have certainly seen in my practice over the years is those from the preteen years from, from about 12 until about 16 or 17 is really tough. And kids jockeying for position and groups and dividing off and 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 just sometimes thinking the right thing to do is to somehow exclude an individual. Very, very hurtful, as I said, can be even worse than the bullying aspect because then how do you fight back on that? What do you do? How do you handle it? And, you know, there are ways that, that I want to get to as we're moving along, but just to expand on this a little bit, I'll, I'll explain there is a, another study that helps answer questions as to why some people are a little more prone not to experience that than others. But before we do that, let's let's go to T on the Gulf Coast, who has a comment about the loneliness aspect. Hi, T. Thanks for calling. Hello. How are you doing now? I'm doing well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I heard where you mentioned, I, I just kind of caught the end of it, where you mentioned uh, loneliness and families and when a person has felt like they've been... Uh, uh, left out of a group or uh, or any situation. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I what I want to say right now. I think right now a lot of people have experienced uh, social anxiety and uh, separation anxiety coming from where we were uh, sheltered in place and isolated. I think that played a big part in people being lonely and uh, now that we're restoring. In our country, uh, you know, everybody's back, getting back on track. 
or getting, you know, themselves going again. I think it's kind of, I know my family in particular, we uh, kind of seemed, because of social media, because of my social media status and other, other things that they're doing, we've gotten a lot of uh, different mixed feelings from people. And so mm-hmm. it causes some of them to kind of withdraw away from me at one point, and then it was making me angry to then have to be, you know, so on the defense because of the response I've gotten, you know, through the internet. Because, you know, so, so many people nowadays are so into social media more so than socializing. That's exactly right. And, you know, you just differentiated something I want to repeat. You said so many people are into social media rather than social life. And they're separate. They are very separate. So go on with that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think that's where a lot of loneliness is coming from. Uh, social media is a lot of pressure for some people to feel included. Uh, I mean, I don't get, I don't get comments and likes on my social media status, but it's a, it's a mixed, it, it's kind of like a mixed emotion. I and mean, I really don't want the, you know, the approval. I just want to, make a statement. You know, it's like, hey, if you you know, if you agree then hey, you agree if you don't, you don't. And and I know a lot of people we, we can see a lot of children and uh, adolescents, adults and elders that are on social media, everyone wants to feel included. So I think a lot of loneliness is coming from separation and social anxiety and it's it's because of being and not because of the internet, but because that's where the largest People, I think, want the larger, uh, I mean, where the larger groups want to be seen and recognized. Yeah. I think you're making some really good points. And you mentioned something else that I want to point out. When when people say something on Instagram or X, formerly known as Twitter, or Facebook or whatever, I, I know Many people look at the number of likes, the number of thumbs up, thumbs down, loves, comments, and the like. And and a lot of people put their their worth, their self worth, in that kind of responsiveness. Oh look, she got sixty likes, and I got one. Um, that's the kind of thing that is is honestly something that is hurting people more than it's helping them. And in fact, there's been a recent push from parents to to not allow their children to participate in social media at all because of many of the issues that have grown from that. The bullying, mm-hmm. the exclusion, as I've mentioned, the uh, the terrible comments that can be made because they're in black and white and nobody's looking at you in the eye and saying that. It's a cowardly way to bully or to hurt people, but it's it's a common way now. And so I think your your point is a good one. You're right that that you know that social isolation that happened a few years ago, it's better, but If you look at the way people are habitually socializing and behaving, it's not what the way it was. And I and and many others, I'm not the only one who thinks this, believe that it's probably never going to get back to to where it was. People have gotten so dependent on social media that they think they're socializing when they are participating in social media, but it's different. And we've talked on this show many times about the value of touch, the value of the human presence. And so I want to just make it very clear to everybody out there who is listening, being on a Zoom call, being on a WebEx or whatever that platform is, or being on social media otherwise is not the same as being with a person and being face to face with them. Yeah, it was it was absolutely supposed to be a, uh, a stand in for a moment in time, but it, it is not at all. It should not at all be a replacement for 
meeting in person and seeing uh, the people that you have relationships with. Absolutely not. And and that is where I think the the growing issues that we are having with depression and anxiety and bullying and loneliness is that that we continue to think that that can be a substitute when in fact at times it can be quite damaging. And so, um, T, I would encourage you that if if you are on on Facebook or Instagram and you feel like it is making you frustrated or feeling bad or that people are reading you wrong, um, I'd get off of it for a while. Give yourself a hiatus, a break. I've heard from many individuals who who were daily consumers of social media and spent hours a day on it and who finally decided that they needed to step back. And every single individual tells me they feel better and that they're more productive because we waste, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it, waste. We waste a lot of time checking those messages, many times messages that we really don't need to read. So, I don't know, T, anything else? Well, I just want to, yes, ma'am, I wanted to just say one more thing. You sure. Know, that it's, I, I really am thankful, though, that you did say that, that I, I should definitely step away, and I've made it my business to say, hey, I, I'm not going to lie to consume me. Although I have a job as a local entertainer, manager, and a scout, there there, there are people, more people online than offline. Because I've been, you know, me, I have, a, I have no problem. I mean, socializing in public, but it's, it's a lot of places to go. And uh, like I said, sports and recreation centers, uh, libraries, places like that, where some people choose not to go because they feel comfortable being introverted. And, you know, those people who like to sit and look at that phone and just try to see what's happening and try to fit in like that. So that's why I said, uh, whenever you mentioned that, I, my family in particular has had a lot of, you know, tapping into the Internet. And now they're becoming more socializing as far as now we're getting back to socializing as a family. But it had me at one point, it had me so paranoid because I was like, is somebody holding my family hostage? Because I can't <laughs> call and get through. I can't text and get through. You know, it's like at one point the phone was only used for the Internet. And it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But you did mention some great outlets for socialization. And if you're feeling lonely or alone, those are good things. Sports centers, exercise centers, um, libraries, free. Libraries are free. So if you don't have a lot of money, you can participate in that. Um, T's got some great hobbies. She does. <laughs> I know. Uh, sounds like you've got lots of good stuff going on. So. I want to see more people, though. You know, I, that, that's why I do that. I, I I attend sports events, but I want to see more people because I love people. It's just certain people that are that I got off track with um, growing up into a crowd that I had to learn to that those are you know you have groups of individuals and then you have individuals. So I've learned now that I have to pick better groups. You know, but, but there's all kinds of groups in this. You know, there's cults, religious groups. There's all kinds of groups. Thank you. Okay, take care. So um, we have open lines. Give us a call and comment on what T said or what we've been talking about, which is that overlooked exclusion, um, left out. Why is that happening and to so many people? And how can you remedy that? What do we need to do? Because ultimately what happens is loneliness sets in. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. We are talking about, I'm still here. Don't forget about me. Welcome back and thanks for listening. We're talking about overlooked Lonely, excluded, ignored, left out, whatever it is. How do we make sure people know that you're still here? You still have something to offer and what what you can do. And so in a, in a couple of minutes, I want to talk about some 
something that some researchers have found that I think is very interesting about the way people present themselves. But before we get to that, I do want to get to our next caller. We have Anatole from Hattiesburg um, with a comment about being lonely. Am I pronouncing your name right? Yes, ma'am, Dr. Buttress. Hi, thanks for calling, Anatole. I just wanted to say I, uh, I'm 36 years old, and at 26, I uh, manifested schizoaffective disorder mm-hmm. and, and uh, became disabled. And uh, so I kind of went through a period where I was very paranoid, and I pushed people away. I lost most of my friends. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't have any kind of romantic life, so it was my family stuck through with me. But uh, in terms of a broader social circle, it just ceased to exist for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, for a while, I felt so lonely. I sought out any contact I could, and I recently uh, I meditated when I was in college, and it changed my life. It it really did, and I just recently got back into meditation. And uh, it it really helps with the feelings of loneliness. Good, good. And uh, but I just wanted to say that one thing I learned is that not having people in your life can be better than having the wrong people in your life. Oh wow, a wonderful thing to say because I don't think people always understand that. And and many times that's a, a lesson that young people don't learn and, and it's a hard le- lesson to learn later in life. So um, that's a really excellent, excellent point to remember. And, you know, I've talked to... Um, individuals who were in bad relationships, who were terrified about getting out of relationships. And and that same comment happens. There are a lot worse things in being alone. And that is having the wrong kind of person in your life who's who's tearing you down or who who is an individual who is destroying the good life that you were trying to build. So Even though being lonely is not a good thing, being alone is much better than than being with that negative individual. So that's a great, great thing to bring up, Anatole. I'm glad you said that. Can I go back? I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Don't go away yet. Um, I want to also say that your meditation thing is um, I, I don't think people use that enough. And and I want to emphasize that. How did you get into meditation? Uh, I went to the University of Mississippi uh, in from 2007 to 2012, uh-huh. and uh, the counseling center there. I was in a really lost place. I was feeling, you know, I, I, I had a deep hole in my heart, and so I went to the counseling center. And I don't know what it's like nowadays, but at the time. They uh, they had a very robust uh, meditation program. With, mm-hmm. I mean, there was sitting meditation, there was walking meditation, mm-hmm. there was even uh, tea meditation where you contemplate all the people who were involved in the process of bringing you the cup of tea that you sipped on. It was just very robust. And mm-hmm. I, I used to weigh 400 pounds, and I dropped down to 230 pounds in two years. Wow, congrats. Uh, I, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, it, it changed my life. It, I mean, I don't want to discount my education, but the counseling center and the meditation it exposed me to was really probably the most fruitful part of my entire college experience. Super. Wonderful. They do have a good meditation center still, from what I understand. And and it's a wonderful technique to use. Okay. And I'm going to tell you one more thing, and then I'll get back to the meditation. Um, Anatole, I know that that probably having lost some friends in your life as you were going through your difficulties was tough. But Tess brought up a couple of things that I'll just remind you of. Uh, Get yourself out there. Go to places where you can meet good people like 
you know, sports centers or are like church if you're into church or or like libraries where you can perhaps see and meet people who have common interests. So think about that. Put yourself out there. Keep using your meditation. I think you've given everybody some good ideas out there. So thank you for your call. Um, yes, ma'am. I, I want to remind everybody, I'm so glad that Anatole brought up the meditation, because when you feel like you're in a tough place, to to make yourself center and think about what's good out there. And sometimes it's, it's just the beauty of what is surrounding you. And... Um, I don't remember if any of you remember back during the pandemic when everybody was getting so very anxious and things were going not well for many people. Um, There was a mindfulness meditation that came out in several different versions where you would concentrate on five things that you can hear, uh, four things that you can, or five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can feel, two things that you can taste, one thing that you can smell, um, to make yourself step through all of that very slowly. And and actually, just very recently, when a friend was struggling with some anxiety, that was one of the calming techniques that we reminded that person about. So keep that in mind and use it. You don't go, I went through it very fast, but you go through it very slowly and make yourself really look around your environment and then close your eyes when you're trying to hear things and really be in tune because you may be in a very quiet space and still be able to hear something like you're breathing, right? And so don't forget about that as you're dealing with whatever uh, mental issue you may be dealing with, whether it's anxiety or depression or loneliness, to try to center on the good stuff. Okay, um, again, we have open lines, so jump in. I'm loving hearing from you guys. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. Well, as I promised earlier in the show, I want to start talking about some of the things that we can do to project that we are someone of value, to make ourselves feel good, and and to keep ourselves from being overlooked. Now, I'm not exactly recommending to do um, what I'm going to talk this study through was about, but I want you to hear this study. There were a couple of psychologists. Again, this is a relatively old study back in 2014. They found that people who were overconfident in their own abilities are typically viewed as more talented by others than they really are. So if you're really confident, you're viewed as being more talented. Overconfident people are more likely to get better jobs, be offered leadership position, and be elected to public office. Hmm. That might not be a huge surprise, right? Um, They also discovered that the opposite is true, that those people who were underconfident in their abilities are viewed as less competent than they really are. So I'm not saying to purport that you are somebody that you're not, but keep in mind, if you have a skill set, it's okay to say you have it. It's okay to say that you write pretty well. And it's okay to say that you you feel like you could do a good job at that. Because if you don't, if you act too humble, then um, you may get passed over. So, you know, if you know what you have to offer, others can't see it. So you have to let them know what your strengths are and, and, 
and what you can do. So if you write well, say, I write well. Or if you if you sing well, say, I can do that part. So step up a little bit. It's okay. I think in the South, so many times, we are expected to be so humble that uh, we don't ever want to brag on ourselves. It's not bragging. It's saying, I have this skill set. I can help out. So that's that's something I wanted to throw out there. Okay, let's go back to the phones. We have Mikey in Mobile with a comment about our topic today. Yeah, and a perfect segue, Dr. Susan. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, something to throw in there, skill set that I've just learned. Um, and in the wake of uh, pretty much everything that everybody that's called in today and in some, a lot of cases, um, hyper extensive um, uh, sorts of situations for me. So, um, yeah, this skill, this new skill set, uh, it, it, it ha- has helped a lot. I didn't, I didn't realize um, for a couple of years or more, because we're talking about COVID, we're talking about the opiate. You know, pandemics, they are both pandemics um, and living through them, surviving them, particularly with um, others whom you love, whom you've lost. Um, the ones that you haven't lost yet, that you kind of go, how do I protect myself from them? Um, uh, that sort of stuff. A, a little bit maybe too uh, raw and brash to go into to specifically for this kind of a program. But what I want to point out is that I just looked into and I went, that's it. I mean, that was a hip, it's a hip slapping formula. Mm. My, I had become um, hyperactive 24 um, seven, but enable, unable to move. Um, uh, due to um, chronic hypochondria. Hmm. And and what sleep I had was visited by dealing with the things or trying to deal, trying to wrestle with the things that were presented to me. But in the la- I've just started it, but so far it's really worked a a lot, a lot for me, a lot for me, uh-huh. and I hope that it will work for other people. That's all I've got to say. Okay, well, thanks, Mikey. I appreciate you calling. All right, we're going to stay on the phones because I want to hear from Anne from South Haven. And you have a comment about loneliness? Yes, um, I have found that. There's always somebody worse off than I am. Mm. And if I reach out to help them, I make a friend or stop being lonely. And I experienced that when I first moved to South Haven and didn't know anybody. And someone in church said I was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I reached out to her and that she's been a wonderful friend for six years. Oh, wow. Um, the, the other issue is that a lot of people want to give and don't know how or feel they want to have a ministry and it has to be something big like going to Africa to help people and you can have small ministries I just met a girl at church who has six special needs children at home but she contacts her elderly next door neighbor frequently to check on her she takes cookies to people that are sick she helps people walking down the street and she does a wonderful ministry one by one by one it doesn't have to be big that is so important because i think many times individuals believe that if they can't organize a a big movement or a big project that there's not much to do. And and you mentioned sort of what was going on for a while, and I hope it's continuing, is sort of the, the pay-forward movement where if 
if someone does an act of kindness to you, just a small one, that you pay forward by trying the next day or within the next week to do something nice and kind for someone else. And yeah. it and you're absolutely right. I want to comment back to your original good deed that you did in reaching out to the woman who um, announced uh, or shared that she had just been diagnosed diagnosed. with Alzheimer's, which is a terrifying diagnosis for, for any one of us. I mean, I think most of us hope and pray that that doesn't happen. But it does, and it's common. And whether it's diagnosed as Alzheimer's or uh, dementia or forgetfulness of old age, it happens. You know what the very best thing you can do for an individual who has any one of those diagnoses that I just mentioned. It's keeping them active, talking to them, making them feel valued, visiting with them, uh, keeping that active mind going. And often what happens, and this is this is probably a topic that we could spend a lot of time on, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> often what happens when someone has a diagnosis like Alzheimer's or cancer, or has had a terrible stroke, often what happens is their old friends step back and withdraw and um, don't know what to say or don't know what to do, so they do nothing. Yes, yes. And she still is able, this was like six years ago, she still is able to do a lot of things. And one of the things that she does is send out cards to people who are ill or it's Christmas time or it's Easter. And she's just been a wonderful friend to me in that way, calling me because I didn't go to church yesterday and am I sick, things like that. You know, they can still do some things, and I just made a friend. Absolutely, and how wonderful that is that she is continuing to try to do kind things for others. And I I would imagine there are a lot of people when they get a diagnosis like that or a negative diagnosis of any kind that, that the tendency would be to turn inwardly and go, why me, and why did this happen to me, instead of even thinking about doing anything for anyone else. So, right, right. Yeah. Well, Ann, thank you for that call. That I, I, I know you've enhanced your friend's life, and it sounds like she's enhanced yours. So that's a, a, a wonderful two-way street. So lots of people need to get out there and make sure they they mimic what you just did. (laughs) That really is. You get more than you give. If only people would remember that. When you give back, you often do get more than you you even were were giving or ever intended to give. So all right. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for participating and listening. Okay, I I do. Gosh, that loneliness topic is something that that always, if we would just remember to make ourselves reach out. And and again, I I told the story at the very beginning of um, my relative who said, I am still here. And we just have to make sure that we notice those people who perhaps have, for whatever reason, had to step back from life a bit um, to make sure that you recognize that they're still here. Okay, we're going to take one more call. We have Tish, Trish in Ellisville. Hey, Trish, thanks for calling. Good morning, yes. Um, it's interesting. I heard your story at the very first, and mm-hmm. I'm reading a book on longevity, Young Forever. And it struck me as how those very people that are older, that are isolated, that are not out in the community maybe as much, are the very ones that can add value to our lives and help extend our lives by including them in our lives. 
Absolutely. And, you know, we've talked about this before, and, and I've encouraged everybody to do this. And and like I said, Trish, I had some real introspection or of whether or not um, letting, allowing myself wow. to say I'm too busy to really um, – gain all that value that you are mentioning, like talking to the individuals about history, about things that happen that um, most of our our kids and our grandkids would never know about. Um, I'll just give an example, and, and you probably have several. Um, my grandkids love to see our uh, our old phones, and they play with them. And we've <laughs> talked to them about how when you got a phone call, you couldn't walk around. You had to stand right there or sit right there, and they had little tables. That kind of history is something that can be so much fun to talk about, right? Right. Add so much value to the child's life. Right. So... I think you're absolutely right. That's a, a great way for us to sort of sum it all up. If we would just remember that that those people who who perhaps now due to health issues or um, other other reasons, mobility issues or whatever, that they are unable to get out, to to reach out to them and to think about all the the incredible bits of knowledge that they can hand back to you. I mean, it sounds a little bit selfish, but but it's an add an an add on and a plus, right? Plus 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 plus. So, thank you so much, Trish, for helping us end up on a real positive note. Um, learning how to enhance each other's lives. That's the way we need to do it. Reach out to those individuals. So you don't get that um, that call back about, I'm still here. Have you forgotten about me? Don't forget about them. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, as always, for listening and being with us. Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and funding is provided in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from listeners like you. And thanks again for donating last week. Keep doing it. If you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by my producer, Abram Nanny. Our call screener is Trey, and our podcast producer, Charles Arnold. I am Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking, and that you'll stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now, coming up next, right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.